If you don't know who I am, my name is uh, Jesse Flora. I'm the student ministry director here. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, I get to hang out with the junior high and high school students all the time. We just had an event last night. So uh, we did, we were all over Manteca. We played uh, The Amazing Race. We, I personally love that TV show. And so we did an event about it and it was a ton of fun. So, um, but I'm a little tired because we were out late. But anyway, um, raise your hand if you love Thanksgiving and you are pumped that Thanksgiving is this week. Raise your hand if that's you. All right, most of you, cool, good. Uh, I love Thanksgiving. I'm all about the mashed potatoes. That's my jam. <laughs> that's where I, that's just, that's what I look forward to every year um, for Thanksgiving, mashed potatoes. Well, anyway, um, so we are in Thanksgiving week, and uh, Pastor Jim is out of town, and so he said, hey, why don't you talk about gratitude? And I said, I will. Let's do it. And um, that's what we're talking about today. And my goal today is that we collectively would not um, view gratitude as just this virtue that we think about once a year, where, oh, it's Thanksgiving. We need to be, we need to be grateful. We need to have gratitude. We need to remember why, you know, how good we have it. That's important. That's good to think about that during this season. Um, but I, I want, hopefully, to, for all of us to leave here convinced that being a grateful person might be like crucial to your well-being and to the impact you have on others around you. That gratitude might be the key ingredient, the, the key thing that you and I are missing out on. Um, maybe, maybe we have in our head this desire to be the man of God that we want to be or the woman of God, the father, the, the wife, the, the mother, the husband, whichever title you have in life, you have aspirations to be um, a certain level of that thing. And maybe, just maybe, gratitude is the thing that is keeping you, like, or a lack thereof, rather, is keeping you from reaching um, that, that desired uh, place in your life. Or maybe it's just simply your relationship with God, your walk with God, your closeness with God. It's very possible that gratitude or a lack of gratitude is keeping you from that closeness that you desire uh, with him. Because gratitude is not just a once a year virtue that we should talk about. Um, it should be a part of who we are as Christians. It should be who, like one of our character, character traits, this is who I am. So um, we're going to get into this, but before we do, I want to show you something on the screen, and we're all going to collectively look at this thing on the screen together. So we're just going to look at the screen. I'm going to count down from 10, and uh, don't worry, nothing's going to jump out at you or anything like that. Um, we're just going to look at the screen, and I'm going to count down from 10. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Get rid of it. Quick, move it. All right, we'll get back to that later. I want to ask a question. Why gratitude? Why gratitude? And on your notes, we have a few fill-in-the-blanks for you. We're going to try to answer this question in a way to convince ourselves that gratitude actually matters all the time. So number one, gratitude is our entry into the presence of God. Gratitude is our entry into the presence of God. It's our key. It's our access point into his presence presence. And if you're like me and you've been a Christian for some time, you have experienced seasons of your life where you can say, yes, I know that I am in the presence of God right now. I, I can feel him. I can sense his guiding. I can sense his comfort. Uh, for me, oftentimes when I truly feel his presence is actually in hard seasons of my life. I know a lot of times we say in the good times we know God is there. Uh, but for me, I've experienced the bad times is when I feel the presence of God the most. But anyway, you can reflect back and think about a season where you felt close with him, and maybe now life decisions or distractions or busyness has kind of moved you away from his presence, and you're here this morning longing, longing for reentry, longing to feel him again, because it's okay to feel God. It's not, you know, we shouldn't just pursue knowledge of God. We should desire closeness with God. It's a relationship. We should sense his presence, and gratitude is the entry into his presence. Here's the cool thing. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, he gave all of us who call upon his name access, permission, uh, a welcome home, if you will, into his presence. The moment Jesus died on the cross, the separation between us and God was the veil, the, the physical veil between the Holy of Holies and everyone else was torn in half, symbolizing that any of us who call upon the name of Jesus, we have access at any moment 
to God's presence, to be close with him. And so if you're here and you've called upon the name of Jesus and you are a follower of Jesus, then at any moment you have permission. You can come home. You can enter in to his presence. But raise your hand if you've ever been locked out of your house before. You have access. It's your home. You have permission to go in, but you're locked out. And you try to climb through the bathroom window and you hurt yourself. So um, that's what happened to me one time. But anyway, um, we have permission to go in. Um, But we need our access point. Let's look at Psalm 100, verse 4. We're going to look at it in the ESV, and then we're going to look at it in the message paraphrase. It says this, enter his courts with thanksgiving. Uh, Sorry, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts, go back to the ESV, sorry, uh, and his courts with praise. So thanksgiving and praise are highlighted there. Give thanks to him, bless his name. Now let's look at the message paraphrase, which is basically an um, attempt to modernize Amer- some American English for us to help understand it. It says, enter with the password, thank you. I love that. Enter with the password, thank you. Make yourselves at home, talking praise. Thank him, worship him. Enter with the password, thank you. Gratitude, a thankful heart, praise. What we just did, worshiping God, raising a hallelujah, singing how great thou art. That is how we access the presence of God. And it doesn't have to come in a collective corporate worship setting like this. It can be one-on-one. You're on a long drive and you just start praising God, just telling him how good he is. Or you start reflecting on all the good that he has done in your life. And what you'll find is as you do this and as you keep doing this, you will, en- you will enter into his presence. And even if you are not a touchy-feely person, you will sense that God is close to you. And that's okay, because this is a relationship. And God is a God who, who cares about you and wants to make you feel loved and cared for. I know there's been seasons in my life where I'm frustrated, uh, annoyed, or, or trying to figure something out, and I'm distracted and stressed. And I've like felt I need to worship. I need to take some time to reflect on God. And I'll turn on a song, a worship song, just by myself. And I'll, I'll listen to the words. And I'll try to, I'll try to relate the words to my life. But I'm still angry. I'm still annoyed. And then the next song will come on. And I'm a little less annoyed. And the next song will come on. And all of a sudden, I, I've found myself going from angry, upset, irritated, stressed to free and liberated, and just loudly and proudly worshiping Him in this quiet room. And the small space by myself. And I'm not trying to say, like, well, play three songs, that's your formula. Like, but whatever works for you. But what happened is, is when I do that, I'm intentionally praising God. It, sometimes it's not going to come easy. I, honestly, a lot of the times it's not going to come easy because you're a busy person. And you live in the modern world and you have your phone distracting you every three seconds. And so you're, it's going to be difficult. So I think we need to be intentional about entering into his presence, and gratitude is the way to do that. But you need the key. Gratitude is the key. When I was in high school, I, was my, I met my wife in junior high, and we dated through high school, and um, I, yeah, she was up here singing. She's the, the pregnant one, baby. Any day, we'll see. Whew, I'm nervous, but anyway. Um, <laughs> I get really nervous about that, but um, she's all calm about it. I'm stressed, so... But we were dating in high school, and her parents had a rule. Parents, this is a great rule. If you are a parent of a teenager or a preteen who eventually wants to date, um, this was a great rule. I was not allowed in the house if they were not at home, even if her brothers, who her oldest, well, it's still her younger brother, but he's almost my age, even if he was there and her, even the younger brother, even if both brothers were there, and trust me, they would not leave us alone. They would bother us the entire time. Even if they were there, I was not allowed to go into the house. And so we would, you know, I would come over pretty much every day. That's how it worked. And I would sit on the porch if they weren't home. And most of the time, Atlanta would not join me on the porch. She'd say, I'll see you in a bit. When my parents get here, she'd go inside. And I remember very vividly a couple winter nights where I thought her parents would be home, or there was a miscommunication, and I show up, and, and it's like, no, they're not here yet. Enjoy your time on the porch, Jesse. I'm going inside. And, um, 
it would be pouring rain, it would be 40 degrees, and I'm shivering on the porch, and I turn and I look in the window, and, and there they are inside drinking hot chocolate and singing songs, and I, I, I'm freezing out here, and, um, and I just remember vividly coming from this side of the street, her parents in the minivan rolling up, seeing me on the porch, shaking, and going, hey, Jesse, good to see you, and I'm like, hurry up, get inside so I can get inside. But anyway, I had permission to be there. I, I was welcome. They, her family was super welcoming to me. They loved me from day one. Atlanta always said they loved me more than her. I don't know if that's true. But I was welcome in their home. I was allowed to be there, but I, couldn't, I didn't have the access. I didn't have the key to get inside. Gratitude is the key to get inside the house of God, the presence of God that you and I all have permission to be in. We're all welcome. We're all children of God. And so it's not like God has, oh, you've sinned, let me lock the door for a little bit. It's us intentionally making decisions, or maybe not necessarily intentionally, but accidentally making decisions that pull us away from his presence. And so we have to remember, gratitude is important. Why gratitude? Because it's our entry into his presence. Uh, I want to show you that screen again. We're going to look at it for another 10 seconds, okay? Uh, Something might jump out at you this time. Uh, I'm going to count down from 10. Let's look at it. 10, 9, Eight, seven, six, five, four. Nothing's going to jump. I was just joking. Three, two, one. All right, get rid of it. We'll come back to that later. We'll get back to that later. Second point of why gratitude. Gratitude leads to freedom. Gratitude leads to freedom. Freedom is my favorite word in the English language. But the problem is, us Americans, we have a different idea of what freedom is versus what the Bible teaches freedom. Or maybe not even just America. We in the modern world, we have this idea that freedom is I can do whatever I want. I'm free. I can do anything, everything I want to do, however I want to do it. It should not matter what you think or what others think because I'm myself and I'm free and I can do whatever I want. See, that's not the biblical idea of freedom. When the Bible talks about freedom or when a, a preacher talks about freedom or you in a Bible study, you guys talk about freedom You should not be thinking the idea, I can do whatever I want. Biblical freedom, actually, sometimes to people who are maybe not followers of Jesus, or even if you are a follower of Jesus, it sometimes sounds like the opposite of freedom. Like, there's all these rules. There's all these guidelines. I don't understand. Why? I'm free. Shouldn't I be able to do whatever I want? And we can get frustrated with that, especially if you're new to the faith and you haven't had time to develop discipline and and spiritual disciplines and and you're frustrated with what feels like a list of regulations. Um, The the truth of the matter is, is that these rules that we see, these guidelines, these regulations really are placed there so you and I can remain free. Because the idea of I can do whatever I want and that is freedom, that's actually slavery disguised as freedom. Because as you go on and do whatever you want, you are spending time and time and time again completely outside of the presence of God, outside of the will of God. And what you're doing is you're placing more and more chains upon yourself. You are, as the Bible describes it, a slave to sin. But if you're a Christian, you've been set free from sin by Christ. And so freedom is not, I can do whatever I want. Freedom is I don't have to live my life doing whatever I want because I'm no longer a slave to doing whatever I want. I've been set free, and I'm on this pathway now. And thank goodness that through the Bible and through the Holy Spirit, God has placed guardrails on the side so I don't fall off the edge. That's what biblical freedom is. And gratitude leads us to freedom. I want you to follow me on this journey a little bit, okay? On this logic train, if you will. So if gratitude, point number one, leads us into the presence of God, and when we are in the presence of God, we are surrounded by his spirit, then that must mean that gratitude leads to freedom because wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Yeah, good job. 2 Corinthians 3, uh, verse 17, for the Lord is the spirit, and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so if you want access to freedom, to feel free in your mind, in your soul, in your heart, in your life, if you want access to that on a daily, regular basis, then gratitude is your entry point into his presence, which brings freedom. You can't experience the full freedom of God without being in his presence. 
And so gratitude, again, is the starting point for all of this. So gratitude leads us to freedom. Jonah, chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. We just did a series on Jonah, but I want to go back to this friend of ours. And I want you to remember back, if you know the story, great. If you don't, I'll refresh you a little bit. Jonah, God called Jonah, hey, go to Nineveh. Jonah said, "Uh uh-uh, I am not going to that city. That place is a dump. They're crazy. I'm not going there. Jonah gets on a boat. He goes the other direction. God says, who do you think I am? I am God. And he sends a storm. And Jonah's on the boat. Everyone's freaking out on the boat. And Jonah says, okay, this is my fault. I'm going to jump overboard to calm so God will stop this storm and you guys won't die. Jonah jumps overboard into the water. The storm ceases. God sends a giant fish to swallow him. And I know people doubt that story. They're like, it's not, it's not realistic. There isn't a fish that can do that or a whale. Well, it has happened recently. I know Pastor Jim talked about it. I think off the coast of Massachusetts, someone was swallowed by a whale and then spit back out like this year. Um, But also it's God. So if God wanted to create a new fish just for that day and say, hey, buddy, your job today is to eat that guy and then then I'm going to get rid of you. Okay. So if God wanted to do that, he could have because he's God. So anyway, so Jonah, he's in this animal underwater, probably thinking he's going to die, and he prays to God. And this is what he says at the end of his prayer, but I will offer sacrifices, because sometimes it's a sacrifice to praise God in the midst of our trials. I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. So he says, all I have to give right now is songs of praise. Back then, they used to do like animal sacrifices. That's how the Old Testament worked, okay? But he's, I mean, he could have killed the fish, I guess, but he's in this fish, and he's like, I got nothing but songs of praise. I've got nothing but to praise your name, nothing but gratitude to give my God. And look what happens in the next verse. Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Jonah, right away, he gives praise to God, and he is spit out. He's released, and he's gone, goes back and does what God has called him to do. Jonah has other issues. We've talked about that before. But anyway, this point, to me, it it reminds me of the song we just sung, Raise a Hallelujah. In the midst of our trials, in the midst of our enemies, in the storm, we're going to choose to bring praise to God, thanksgiving to God, a grateful heart to God. That leads to freedom. There's story after story after story in this Bible, and story after story in my life and probably your life or loved one's lives where in the midst of trial, in the midst of stor- storm, someone chose to praise God, and God brought freedom and breakthrough and deliverance. And I'm not saying it's this perfect formula, and I know there's things that some of you have been praying for your entire life that have not taken place. And there's real deep hurt. But I do know just from personal experience and reading the Word of God that when we bring praise to God, when we bring a grateful heart to Him, and we lift His name on high, that God moves, that things happen. And maybe freedom comes in different forms. Maybe freedom comes in a form of understanding why I'm in this hard time. God giving you perspective on what you're going through. Or it's breakthrough in in an incredible miracle form of healing and, and redemption and restoration of someone. I just know based on this Bible and based on my life and my family and friends' lives that gratitude, in fact, does lead to freedom. I want to show that screen again. Let's look at that screen again. Um, take, take your time. We'll, I'm not going to count this time. I'll just let you observe, and, um, you know, I, 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 I don't, we'll just see what happens. We'll see what happens. Um, don't, don't, don't look away. Just look at it. Okay, get rid of that thing. We'll come back to that later. We'll come back to it. Point number three, why gratitude? Well, because gratitude is essential for us to experience the fullness of joy. It's essential for us to experience the fullness of joy. What I'm saying is that without gratitude, you cannot experience the fullness of joy. The fullness of joy that Jesus died and has because of what he's done in our lives, he has given us access to. Joy at its deepest level. Joy at the most impressive amount you can imagine. True peace of mind. True uh, just gratitude and, and contentment with who you are and where you are and what God's doing in your life. 
walking through life where seasons of hurt and pain do not tear you down, but instead you have perspective through those seasons that God is still good. And so if you want to experience the fullness of joy, gratitude is essential for us um, to experience that. When I was uh, working, trying to figure out this message, I found out, you know, talking about gratitude, I uh, was talking with Andrew, who led worship a minute ago, and I was, try- I was like, I don't know what to call this message. I guess I could just call it, you know, attitude of gratitude, but that sounded too cheesy. And um, it's just a good rhyme, but anyway. And he's like, well, what do you think of when you think of the word uh, gratitude or grateful? And so I closed my eyes. I'm a very visual person, and I closed my eyes, and I began to just think about that word and what I felt like when I really was in a season where I had a grateful heart. And what came to my mind was this image of an early morning. Maybe if you go camping or you go to like retreats often, which we do with the students, um, I, I always, when we go on those camps or retreats, I choose to try to get up as early as I can so I can experience that early morning mountain air and light. And the best is like winter camp when the snow is on the ground and there's like mist coming off the buildings and the trees and the the light is shining through the pine uh, needles and you breathe in that cold, fresh air. And for me, when I'm in that space, when I'm in that uh, uh, just area up in the mountains at a camp or something, I take a deep breath and I feel what I would consider a grateful heart, fully content not worried about what's next. Things have slowed down for me in my mind. And there's a peace and a joy. There's something about an early morning. If I can get up, (laughs) I am a morning person. The challenge is not hitting snooze. But once I am up, I love the morning. I love if I get up before my family and I go downstairs and make coffee and just sit in the living room with light coming through the windows. I just feel at peace. There's a stillness, a a, a true, just, I feel closer to God in those moments. And maybe you hate the morning, so this makes no sense to you. But whatever that space is for you, for me, it's the morning time. And that's what I, the visual I got when I thought about gratitude. Because like the morning, when you have a grateful heart, there's this eagerness for the day. There's this great expectation for what God can do that day. There's a freshness, a new beginning. There's, there's endless opportunities. There's peace. There's relaxation. You're not, if you get up early, you're not in a hurry and rushed and anxious. And so for me, when I think about a grateful heart, I want my heart to feel like a mountain morning with fresh air, renewed, eager for what the day is going to bring, light just shimmering through my life. And so that's why we called this message Grateful Like the Morning, because for me, that's what I want my heart to feel like, and that's what I want others to feel like when they're with me. I want them to be with me and feel renewed and refreshed and encouraged because I have a grateful heart. And so to experience that, to experience that fullness of joy and that peace that the Bible promises us, We need to come to God with a grateful heart. If our heart is a bitter heart and an angry heart and an agitated and frustrated and anxious heart, we are not going to feel fresh and new and at peace and eager for what God can do. And trust me, you're not going to refresh anyone else because you're going to be crabby and cranky and rude and upset. Gratitude is what renews your heart. Reflecting on who he is and what he's done puts in perspective your life, and it gives you this fresh feeling and this eagerness for what what God has to offer in this life. And I think the sad part is, and why oftentimes Christianity gets a bad rap, and because, you know, oftentimes why people don't go to church is because we got a body full of Christians who talk about things like gratitude, but who are walking around work short with people, rude, angry, bitter, snapping at others, being rude at a restaurant, or arguing on social media, or just, just walking around with a crabby and bitter heart and mouth and mind. And then <laughs> there's no surprise that people say, I don't want anything to do with that. I don't want to go to church. Church people are, are cranky. Church people are mean to me. I, I, I just drove by someone with a fish sticker on their car and they flipped me off. You know, people aren't going to go to church because oftentimes we as Christians, we, we kind of ruin, um, we ruin what church is and, and following Jesus is by our 
actions. And, and oftentimes, it's not just at work. It's not just at home. It's, it's here. We're walking around at church bitter and angry and rude and frustrated about something here. And I just want to encourage all of us as the church of God, not just Calvary, let's have a grateful heart, the fact that we can even be here, the fact that we can even praise God this morning, the fact that we can be with one another in this room because a year ago we couldn't be. And here we are. We're together. And that's because our God is good. There are scary statistics and scientific studies about a lack of gratitude. And I, I'm going to share these, but I want you to understand I'm not just randomly pulling stats out of the air. This, see, God cares about every aspect of you, of your life. He didn't just create your spiritual side. He created your entire self, your body, your mind, your emotions, your soul, every aspect of who you are, God created, except your sin, okay? But anyway, this is important stuff. And so understand that God looks at us holistically, and we should take a holistic approach as well. So meaning we shouldn't just have gratitude on a Sunday morning. This should be a daily thing. 90% of all illness and disease is stress and anxiety related. 90%. And that could be stress and anxiety caused or uh, worsened by stress and anxiety, but 90% of every illness and disease is impacted by your stress and anxiety. What you think about matters. Studies show that people with high levels of negativity, so if you consider yourself a negative person, you're, a pes- you're always thinking about the negative side of things, you're maybe pessimistic about things, you're discouraged all the time, there's never hope, it's always gloom and doom, and that's you, I mean, I'm not, I'm not judging you, that's okay, I walk through that too, okay, but it, studies show that people with high levels of negativity are more likely to suffer from heart disease brain disease, to recover more slowly from illnesses, to have digestive issues. So there are physical and mental uh, problems that occur when you have a negative or bitter mindset or bitter heart rather than a grateful heart. What you think about matters. What you think about, what you reflect on, what you look at, it matters. And for us as Christians, if we want to live free, at peace of mind, walking through storms, knowing that God is there. Gratitude is essential for us. All right, let's look at that screen again. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you what's it about. What's it, what it's about. There we go. I can speak English. Okay. A professor at a college handed out uh, papers that looked just like that, white with the black dot, and uh, handed it out to every student. He said, hey, your assignment today is to write an essay about what you see. And so they did, they started writing, and they turned it all in, and and the professor um, got all the papers, and he read through, and every single paper wrote extensively about the black dot. And if you're like me, every time I've showed this on the screen, that's what you've been looking at, the black dot on the screen. That's what your eye is drawn towards. Every single student in that class wrote extensively about, like, I'm talking like the circumference of the black dot, what it makes you feel like, and all these things. And no one, not a single student wrote anything about the white space around it. Not a single student. Even though the black dot takes up less than like 2% of that screen or that paper, the focus is on that black dot. We do the same thing in our lives. Even though God has given us endless white space, endless good, endless love, endless comfort, endless support, we focus in on the 1% that doesn't feel so good. And instead of going to God, praising him for the long list of good and attributes of who he is, we instead, we open our prayers with, God, I'm, I don't know what you're doing. I'm not sure why this is going on, but I just found this out. Or, God, I really need you to step in here. As Christians, we need to change our perspective. We need to, and it's intentional, it's not easy, but we need to daily intentionally realize that there is endless good to what God has done in our life. There are endless good attributes of who our God is. 
There are stories in our lives that we can reflect on. Some of the times when I have felt closest to God is when I have intentionally just listed off all the good that he's done, all the prayers that he has answered, because it's so easy to forget about all that when we are faced with a situation. We think, oh, this is life or death. This is the end. This is the end. I need God. Are you going to step in? And God's like, hey, when have I ever showed you that I, I won't or I can't? Because there's this long list behind our whole life, along our whole timeline of God's goodness and God's grace and God's love. And I'm not saying that bad doesn't happen, that bad things don't happen, that there isn't hurt, because we live in a broken world. Things are going to take place. We're going to face seasons of hurt and seasons of pain. But because of the goodness of our God, we as Christians can choose to be grateful for who he is, even in the midst of the trial, even in the midst of the storm. And that leads us to our last point. The challenge this, this morning is that gratitude is a choice. Gratitude is a choice. This is not an easy thing. This is not a, oh, I can just do, I can just, you know, I'll be, gra- I'll be grateful at some point. You know, I can just walk through my life and, you know, if I want to be grateful, the feelings will come. No, oftentimes they will not. And we will have to choose in the moment to be grateful. Even in the dark times, I want to read, we're going to, this is our main passage, and it's coming in right at the end, okay? Acts chapter 16, we're going to talk about Paul and Silas for a minute. And so Paul and Silas, they are missionaries, and they go on this journey all throughout these cities, going from town to town, declaring the name of Jesus. They are living out the Great Commission. What Jesus has called them to do, they are doing. And they're doing boldly and bravely, declaring his name to every single person that they come across. And, they're, and, and they're, they're doing well. They're doing a good job at it. And then this is what happens. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. Verse 23, next one, please. I'll read it out of my Bible. You know, I should just read out of the Bible anyway. It's, I love this Bible. They were severely beaten, and they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. Hold on. So around midnight, in the middle of the night, in this dark prison, Paul and Silas, bleeding, bruised, hurting, chained, choose to praise God. They could have complained. I would have. God, I'm doing exactly what you told me to do. I'm living out the call. I'm going above and beyond. I've left my friends and family behind, and I'm on this missionary journey, and I am telling everyone I see about you, so why did I just get beaten and thrown in this jail? That's what I would be, that's what I would be thinking. That's what I would be saying. But instead, they choose to praise God. And wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake. And the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, Stop! Don't kill yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, it's probably two or three in the morning, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced because they had all believed in God. Gratitude is a choice. Paul and Silas, in my opinion, had every right not to be grateful. They had every right to be frustrated or confused or hurt just emotionally. But God, why would you allow this? We are your servants, and we are doing everything we can to complete the mission you've called us to do, and here we are in prison. Yet in that prison, they choose to praise his name. 
They choose to sing hymns. They choose to worship the God of the universe, the God who, if he wanted to, could have stopped all that from happening, and he chose not to because God had a bigger plan. You see, because of Paul and Silas's gratitude, an entire family discovered Jesus because of their choice to be grateful, not because of just an accidental, oh, yeah, they talked about Jesus. No, they chose And could you imagine the kind of testimony that was to the jailer and the other prisoners that these two guys who were thrown into jail for telling people about Jesus and were beaten, here they are in the middle of the night worshiping that same God. And then an earthquake takes place in the middle of their worship and all the doors are opened and the jailer thinks, I'm going to get tortured for failing at my job and so he wants to end his life. And Paul and Silas say, hold up, none of us have left. Could you imagine the impact on the jailer? I think that's why so quickly he gave his life to the Lord and his family did because he's like, you guys don't understand. These guys were preaching God. They got beaten, thrown in prison, and they were still praising his name. And then an earthquake happened, and then they saved my life. We have to believe in their God. You see, your choice to be grateful or to be bitter has direct impacts on the people around you. You You may never know the missed opportunities that you had to show someone the love of Christ, but you missed out because you were in a bad mood or because you were upset about something or you were bothered by something. You may never know the people who have walked through this building looking for hope, longing for answers, and you gave them a dirty look or you were frustrated that they didn't know where to go in the building and you were trying to get around or whatever. You may never know your choice of bitterness and crabbiness could have completely turned them away from God. But you also might not ever know what kind of impact your choice of gratitude may have. For someone, the most impressive, like most inspiring people I've ever met are the people who are in the midst of like cancer and they are just praising God. Every word that comes out of their mouth is, God is so good. I'm like, you, you are suffering, and yet you're still praising God? That inspires me so much. And so even in the midst of your suffering, even if you think you have every excuse to be bitter and upset and rude, the testimony of you choosing instead to be filled with praise, oh man, that speaks volumes to people. And I want us here at Calvary to be the kind of church that chooses gratitude so consistently here and out there that we can actually see the impact that those choices make. That we can hear stories of people who have walked into this building looking for hope and love and say, man, I met a can- someone who's surviving through cancer and they were just full of love and full of life and that inspired me that there's something special about this place. Or I just met someone at our church, at this church I came because I was hurting and I wanted to find hope and I met someone who's struggling with this family relationship and, or, or whatever and, and, and there's a lot of hurt and pain and they were telling me about it but every word that came out of their mouth was praise to God. Something about that inspired me me that I need to be a part of this. And then at work, in your workplace, in your community, because we're not called just to be here. We're called to be out there six out of the seven days and to be in our community loving others and showing them the love of Christ. Could you imagine the impact that we as a church could have if every single one of us in this room chose daily to be grateful, thankful, praising people? I think we would see hundreds, if not thousands of people come to discover who Christ is. I really believe that. It's because gratitude is not just a virtue that we talk about once a year. It's not something that we, okay, I better, as we go around the dinner, dinner table, f- tell everyone, it's my turn, I'm thankful for this. Okay, let's eat the mashed potatoes. You know, that, that's not what it should be. It should become a, a part of who we are. I want to be, what, I want people to say, that guy is obnoxiously grateful. He's annoyingly positive. That's who we should be. And if you find yourself here and you're, and you're, tr- you're making an excuse in your mind, excuse that harshness, but you're making an excuse in your mind that, well, I'm just not, I'm just not that kind of person. I'm a pessimist. I'm more negative. I want to challenge you. You don't have to be that way. There's so much freedom in a grateful heart. 
And I'm challenging myself because I too, in certain areas of my life, tend to just drift to negativity. And so this is a challenge for me. But may we be a church that chooses gratitude. Why? Because gratitude is extremely important to our own lives, our body, our mind, and our soul, as well as those around us. I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll be on our way. Lord, we thank you so much for this message um, that you've brought us through, through Paul and Silas's life, as well as the other scriptures that support it. I just pray that we would adopt it as our own, and that we would choose intentionally, even in the midst of trial, even in the midst of frustration, even if our days are going terribly, that we would choose to be at peace and to have gratitude and to praise you. Why, God? Because you are so good. And none of us deserve the breath we're breathing right now but yet you've given us new life, you've given given us new hope, and I personally know how crazy that is because of my past mistakes and my tendencies to sin, but God, you've set me free, and so I wanna praise you, Lord. May we be the kind of church that people in our community know as the church that is ridiculous, ridiculously grateful, that every single people in there, no matter their life circumstance, no matter what they're going through, that every single person in this room would choose and walk in a praise just praise-driven life, where every, every thought, every word that comes out of their mouth brings glory to your name. Jesus, we thank you for giving us a reason to praise you, for giving us multiple reasons to praise you. May we always dwell on you and on what you've done for us and who you are. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.